Yes. So we are about to start the presentation. Uh, um, as an introduction, uh, we are a law firm uh, here in Gurgaon, based in Gurgaon, and we deal in all type of indirect taxes, direct taxes, company law matters, and uh, allied laws. Uh, we have uh, five partners, and partners are all from uh, either big fours or uh, from top tier law firms, having uh, the uh, good deal of experience ranging from more than 10 years to around 37 years. So uh, this is just a brief introduction about ourselves. And now uh, we will be starting the un uh, presentation on union budget 2022, covering the direct tax and indirect tax uh, slides in detail. Uh, the in, in indirect taxes, we'll be covering customs and GST. And apart from that, after thereafter, we will be taking up the direct tax portion. Uh, to start with, uh, we have Rajat Dosi, he is one of the partner of RSC Legal Solutions, and he'll be starting with the customs portion first. So I hand over to the uh, screen to Rajat Dosi. Hello and uh, good morning to all. So let us first have a look at all the changes which have been proposed in the customs law. To begin with, firstly, they've introduced provisions to resolve the controversy surrounding DRI's jurisdiction to issue Shokal notice. As a background to this, uh, please note that last year, the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Canon India had set aside the Shokal notice issued by DRI on the ground that DRI does not have jurisdiction to issue show call notice, they are not the proper officers under section 28 of the Customs Act to issue show call notice. They said that the assessing officer at the time of import and export is the proper officer. In this, they also held that DRIs have been issuing show call notices on the basis of notification which has been issued by board, empowering them to issue show call notice. This was issued under section 2, subsection 34 of the Customs Act. They said these notifications are also bad in law on account of the fact that A, the board does not have power any anywhere in the customs law to authorize DRI to act as proper officer and issue show cause notice. There is no such power available with the board. Secondly, they said that notifications right now issued under section 2, subsection 34 are also not valid in law because of the simple reason that this provision is a definition clause. It, it defines what a proper officer is under the provisions of the Customs Act. It does not give any sort of power to the board to authorize DRI to issue show cause notice. So the sum and substance of it is that Honorable Supreme Court held that DRI is not the proper authority to issue show cause notice. Demand raised by DRI are illegal, bad in law and deserves to be set aside. This judgment caused a lot of embarrassment to the government. In fact, once this judgment was uh, rendered, following this judgment, several high courts, tribunals across India started dropping demands raised by DRI. And at some at one point, it was believed that all show call notices issued by DRI will be uh, challenged and will be set aside. In fact, assessees went a step ahead and even started applying this logic in case of show call notices issued by audit wing, preventive wing. So this, this was a very onerous situation for the government. It was very much likely that sooner or later the provisions will be rectified to rectify the anomaly which has been pointed out by the Supreme Court. In fact, the against the Canon India judgment, the, the department went in a review petition which is pending as of this moment, but without waiting for an outcome of that review petition in this year's budget, they have revised the very provisions and rectified the anomaly which has been pointed out by the Canon India judgment. Now, how they've done it, that is, they've done that in two scenarios. One is they want to take care of all the future cases. Second is they want to take care of all the pending matters. Now for future cases, what they've done is, they have inserted new sections, section 5.1a and section 5.1b. This section basically empowers the board and the principal commissioner of customs and the commissioner of customs to authorize 
any officer of customs as proper officer meaning thereby they can authorize any officer including the of dri officers preventive wing officers to issue show cause notice and act as proper officers under section 28 of the customs act so therefore what they have done is they have sought to rectify the very anomaly which was pointed out by the honorable supreme court this in itself is only a enabling provision this per se does not give jurisdiction to dri but hopefully after these provisions are enacted we will see a notification from the board authorizing dri audit and preventing wing officers to act as proper officers and issue show cause notice apart from this two other ancillary changes have also been made like in section 3 now they have specifically provided that officers of customs will include officers of dri audit and preventive formation this in my opinion is a clarificatory amendment so that any novel new argument is not taken challenging the jurisdiction that dri officers are not officers of customs so just to clarify that they have inserted it by way of a specific amendment lastly just to consolidate the entire position they have amended the definition of proper officer in section 2 subsection 34 now proper officer will mean officers of customs who are interested such functions by the board or by the principal commissioner of customs under the above new section section 5 1a and section 5 1b so effectively what they have done is they have nullified the very reasoning given by the honorable supreme court in the case of canon india and now they have interested and given powers to the board to authorize any officer to act as proper officer and issue show cause notice in which they can issue notifications to authorize dri Uh, audit wing, preventive wing to issue show cause notices under Section 28. So they have taken care as far as future is concerned to uh, resolve this anomaly. Now, for past, what they have done is they have inserted a validation clause, clause 96 of the Finance Bill 2022. This validation clause basically validates, in a sense, all the sh- pending show cause notices issued by DRI, audit wing, preventive wing. and at the same time it also seeks to validate all the earlier notifications issued by board wherein they had empowered certain officers of customs to act as proper officer and issue show cause notice so effectively they have rendered the canon india judgment redundant in the sense they have validated everything which was negated or everything which was held to be illegal or bad in law by the canon india judgment plus they have also given retrospective effect to these new section section 5 3 and 2 by deeming them to be effective or in force at on material times so as far as all pending show cause notices are concerned all the earlier notifications authorizing dri and audit wing to uh, act and issue show cause notice are concerned they have now been validated so the final position which emerges as of this moment is that canon india has now been rendered redundant if today there is a show cause notice issued against me and if i approach judicial forum and uh, try to argue that in line with the, uh, the honorable supreme court judgment in the case of D, uh, canon india dri does not have the jurisdiction then the courts will not accept this argument now all pending matters have now been taken into account so the scenario is such as we have pointed out in the table before you that if show cause notices are issued in future by dri they will be valid if a notification to that effect is issued by the board after these provisions are enacted authorizing dri to issue show cause notice now all matters all show cause notices which are pending which have been issued prior to the enactment of these provisions they will also be valid in view of the uh, validating clause clause 96 which has been introduced in the and made a part of the finance bill lastly all show cause notices which have been adjudicated and set aside either by the adjudicating authority or by the appellate authority they will also be valid if a appeal against that order has been pa- filed by the department or the period to file appeal is still pending with the department and eventually they go ahead and file a appeal now here one gray area one contentious area which we feel will lead to more litigation is Uh, specifically in those cases where dri notice was issued prior to the enactment of these provisions that notice has been set aside by either the adjudicating authority or by the appellate forum and no appeal has been filed by the department and even the period to file appeal is 
lapsed. So in such cases, certainly if department tries to reopen such cases using the validation clause, the SSEs naturally would want to argue and will be arguing that the validation clause only validates pending show cause notices. It does not validate show cause notices which are over, which are done and dusted because the idea or the very objective of validation clause was to prevent or to take care of pending show cause notices, but show cause notices, which are already over, which have already been set aside, no appeal has been filed, period to file appeal is also over. That is not sought to be um, uh, validated by this validation clause. Only time will tell how department argues their case in front of courts and what are the, uh, what is the opinion of the court in this regard. But this is certainly one limited gray area we could uh, find out and highlight uh, before you. Um, uh, now, but but having said that, this 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 uh, this area or this grey area will arise only in very few matters. Next, certain uh, key changes have been made in the advance ruling mechanism. Firstly, the period to withdraw the application has been increased from the existing thirty day period. Right now, thirty days are available after filing the application with me to withdraw the application. Now they have extended and said. I can withdraw it any time before the ruling is pronounced by the advanced ruling authority. So they have extended the period available with me to withdraw the application. Next is a very relevant and a very important change which has been brought in this year's budget. Now they have given a validity period of three years to all advanced rulings which are issued by the advanced ruling authority. So what, what they have said in a sense is that once the advanced ruling is issued by the advanced ruling authority, that ruling will be valid and binding for a limited period of three years. After three years, this will be neither be binding on the SSE nor on the department. So they've given a sort of a sunset clause to all advanced rulings to be issued. This in our opinion is very regressive and very onerous because if, first of all, we believe that this will discourage a lot of applicants to, uh, who uh, wanted to file an application before the advanced ruling authority because usually advanced rulings are sought so as to achieve a little certainty in business operations. Now, once the, once the validity period itself is for, for a limited period of three years, I don't think many applicants will be very keen on going for a advanced ruling to that effect. Secondly, this in our opinion will necessitate filing for an advanced ruling, filing for a renewal after a period of every three years. So this, this it in itself is very onerous, cumbersome, and, uh, and definitely not towards the uh, uh, intended objective of ease of doing business. So th this, according to us, is very, very uh -huh. onerous and may lead to complications uh -huh. or problems in the sense uh -huh. that, say, for instance, uh, I think uh, someone has been unmuted, we unmute everyone. Uh -huh. Uh, okay, fine. So, uh, as I was saying that this is a very onerous uh, and a regressive condition which has been introduced. Even for existing advanced ruling, they have given a period of three years. They have said that this three-year time period will start once the Finance Act is enacted. Uh, this may lead to unnecessary problems like, say for instance, today you go for an advanced ruling. The advanced ruling is issued in your favor. And after three years, once you apply for renewal, then they give a contrary opinion. Now, in that situation, what will happen is uh, anyone's guess or definitely the SSE, the applicant will challenge it before High Court that since there is no change in law, change in facts, the advanced ruling authority should not give a contrary opinion, but there is no there is no clarity to that effect. So this is a very onerous change, which everyone should take a note of, especially people who have already taken business decisions on the basis of advanced ruling issued in their favor and uh, take a call whether after every three years they want to go for a renewal or not. Next is they have made certain key changes in the import of goods at concessional date of duty rules 2017. 
these rules are usually made applicable in a case where the benefit under a notification is to be made available subject to the goods being used for a intended purpose in such all such cases the notification <laughs> is uh, subjected to a condition that the importer follow the uh, these import of goods at concessional rate of duty rules right now before these amendments all the all the, ru the rules provide is for several uh, several permissions to be obtained several intervention uh, uh, intimations to be given manually so now these rules have been amended to first of all reduce the procedure to a large extent and automate the procedure so that less and less customs intervention is involved now what changes have been brought is first of all they have said that if anyone wants to avail the benefit of a notification which is subject to these rules they simply have to make a application online in form igcr1 on the online customs portal once this form is filled with all the relevant information a uh, identification number will be generated this identification using this identification number they are required to execute a continuity bond with the jurisdictional customs authority the details of this identification number and the continuity bond is required to be indicated in the bill of entry once that is done the customs authority will allow you the benefit of the said notification so they have they have reduced the uh, reduced the permissions required to a larger extent and try to automate the entire system in a and this certainly will be assisting and aiding the assessees uh, the importers uh, uh, a lot next is that they have in place of the existing quarterly statement they have introduced a monthly statement which also has to be filed online in form igcr3 by the 10th day of the following month so this also is a key change which should be kept in mind all these rules have been implemented with effect from 1st march 2022 so next month onwards you need to take care of all these compliances additional compliances next is that in the last year's budget they had made available the facility to uh, the importer to send the imported material to a job worker for undertaking job work activities. In this year's budget, they went a step ahead and they have allowed the facility of inter-unit transfer also. So this is also one very important change and this will also assist a lot of assessees and a lot of assessees should keep a note that they can now send imported goods to their other <coughs> unit, maybe in the same state or some other state and uh, that is also permissible now no permissions are required only intimation is required now last change is uh, something which is very important and uh, which will lead uh, which we feel will lead to a lot of litigation is now they've specified that all the imported goods should be used for the intended purpose within a maximum period of six months so here also they have put a substantive conditional or additional condition over and above the notification. And if I don't make use of it within the specified period of six months, I will have to pay customs duty along with interest. So all people who are intending to avail the benefit of uh, these rules or are already availing the benefit of these rules should ensure that from the next month onwards, they have a system in place which ensures that the goods after import are put to use within a maximum period of six months to avoid any sort of litigation, to avoid any sort of additional custom duty liability along with interest. I feel, again, this is a very onerous and a regressive condition in the sense that this certainly I feel will be challenged before High Court and Supreme Court via red petition because the this addition is a, adding a substantive condition to the notification when there is no such condition in the notification. So I feel on that ground it certainly will be challenged. Only time will tell whether people are successful in getting this condition invalidated or high courts opine that this condition is also procedural in nature and uh, can be can be kept as it is. But that only time will tell how, how courts react to this condition. Then there are certain key changes other, other than this, like in the speech given by the Honorable Finance Minister, uh, she has indicated time and again that the existing SEZ act will be replaced with a new legislation which will involve states and will try to automate the entire process much automation will be introduced therein this new legislation will be made effective from september 2022 
as of this moment they have not put the new legislation in the public domain but hope we are hopeful that in maybe a couple of weeks or days from now the new legislation will put in public domain uh, once the once the legislation is put in public domain we'll be doing another webinar on this wherein we'll appraise our sec units developer and co developer what what all changes have been brought and what all things they need to streamline so so that from september onwards they are compliant with the uh, new statutes like last year's budget this year also they have uh, withdrawn close to 350 outdated exemption notification so that also uh, is uh, something which uh, should be kept a note of next they have uh, made several unconditional exemption notification part of tariff itself as a, a simplification process now what they have done is so say for instance for a particular tariff item the tariff rate is 10% equally we have a unconditional exemption notification for that very tariff providing a tariff rate of 5% so what they have done is they have removed the exemption notification and in the tariff itself they have put tariff rate to be 5% so this is also a, a mechanism to achieve uh, simplification and uh, so that uh, uh, there is there is less less ambiguity and more clarity for businesses while they want to take business actions lastly one very important clarifications they have issued they have clarified now that whenever basic customs duty is zero social welfare surcharge will also be zero even though there may not be a separate exemption for social welfare surcharge now why this problem was arising is that in many cases there is only a exemption providing exemption from basic customs duty like in case of import under advance authorization epcg ou we only have exemption from basic customs duty we do not have a separate specific exemption from social welfare surcharge in such cases now department in certain cases at certain places was taking a call that Uh, since there is only exemption from basic custom duty there is no exemption from social welfare surcharge so you can avail the benefit of bcd exemption but you you are not entitled to uh, avail exemption from social welfare surcharge you are required to pay that in cash now they have clarified that if bcd is exempt bcd is zero social welfare surcharge will also be zero so this is a beneficial clarification which they have issued now the last change key change which we would like to discuss in the customs portion is they have uh, sought to phase out the existing benefits which are available under the project import scheme and they have now intended to increase the rate of basic customs duty for project import uh, scheme imports to 7.5% how they have done it that is they have said that for all projects which are registered till 30th september 2022 will have a will uh, will be uh, will be entitled to import under the existing rate of bcd which is nil 2.5% or 5% for all the imports they make till 30th september 2023 so if i get the project registered before 30th september 2022 for the next one year i'll be entitled to the existing basic customs duty benefit available under the project import scheme but after 30th september 2023 the rate of basic customs duty for imports for project registered uh, the till 30th september 2022 will also be 7.5% and for projects which are registered after 30th september 2022 the rate of basic customs duty will be 7.5% so this is something which is very relevant and all people who are intending to avail the benefit of project import scheme should try and get their projects registered before 30th september 2022 and ensure the that all the imports therein are completed and made within 30th september 2023 so that they can make use of the existing exemptions available for basic customs duty after that they will have to pay 7.5% which will be higher basic customs duty rate now changes related to gst will be taken up by shweta so i'll invite shweta to take over thank you rajat i hope uh, it was quite a uh, good session 
uh, which you must have really understood. And if you have any queries, you may please drop it in the chat box or in the last, we will be taking up the question answer round in which you can raise your queries pertaining to any of these slides. And accordingly, we will also answer them. <clears throat> So uh, going further, I'll be taking up the GST session. And th after the GST session, we will be having the session on direct tax. Uh, in GST, as we all know that normally uh, during the year, the changes are being brought out by the uh, GST council. So, uh, and uh, it is through the notifications and when they get published in the official gazette that they come into effect. So now also, these are the proposed changes that have been done by the government in the budget. So these are not yet effective. These will be effective only when they get approved uh, and get the presidential assent and are not uh, uh, and are notified in the official gazette. So that could be possibly in somewhere in April and May. But however, because these are the proposed changes, so we should all be well prepared for what kind of changes are being uh, announced in the GST law as well. So uh, the GST changes have been brought out in um, four different categories, uh, which we would like to highlight. One is the input tax credit, the GST liability, then pertaining to compliances. Then there are certain miscellaneous changes which have been introduced. Then in input tax credit, um, the first change that has been brought is pertaining to the additional time given. So in section 16, earlier the time uh, for availing the credit uh, for the last financial year, previous year, was maximum up to the return due date of return of September, which was usually which was the twentieth October. Uh, but now this date has been extended to thirtieth of November. It is worth noting that this is not the November return date. This is, they have just prescribed a specified date that till 30th September, you can take the credit. So how that, that will be given effect to, there is still a little bit of anomaly. Uh, reason being whether the impact would be taken up in the October return, which is to be filed in by the 20th of November. Uh, then if we say that thing, then uh, actually the due date of 30th November somewhat becomes redundant. And if we say that it is, or, or do we say that it is for the return of November, which is uh, due to be filed by 20th December. So because that is uh, November, gets an end on 30th November. So therefore, its return gets filed on 20th December. So is it that thing? So uh, there is no clarity as of now on this. Uh, let's hope that there is some sort of clarity, whether it will be the October return or the November return, because actually speaking, there is no deadline of 30th November in the GST law per se. Then uh, the next change that has been brought in the input tax credit is that I, wherever the ITC is denied to the vendor, so ITC claimed by the recipient, but supplier has not paid the tax, then in that case, ITC has to be reversed along with the receipt interest by the recipient. And the same could be reavailed by the recipient once it is paid by the vendor. So uh, there is uh, there are two things in this. One is uh, if your supplier, you procure the goods, your supplier does not pay the tax uh, in his 3B, though he has submitted his GSTR 1, and that gets reflected to you in your GSTR 2B as well. But uh, still, uh, since he has not filed uh, the, uh, he has not paid the tax. So uh, it is as per the law, the change which has been made that you cannot take the credit of that. And this is, an, uh, this is a change which has been introduced in section 41 which says that if you take the credit of such claim, then in that case, um, uh, you will have to reverse this along with interest. And uh, thereafter, once he pays the tax, then he, it could be reavailed by the recipient. So uh, uh, how will that be effectuated? This is a statutory provision which has been introduced in the section per se. But since uh, there is a law which states that the uh, credit which is appearing only in your 2B will be eligible for the credit, uh, it will be eligible to the uh, recipient. So in that case, how this will be effectuated, how will the recipient know whether he has paid the tax or not? How will the recipient know when he has paid the tax, when earlier if he has uh, reversed the credit along with the interest? So these are the finer nuances. Maybe we hope that uh, some sort of notification might come on this or uh, there could be some amendments in the rule pertaining to how the things would be reflected in GSTR 2B. 
Um, then there is a stricter condition which has been put in uh, input tax credit. Uh, the condition is uh, ITC can be claimed if not restricted in GSTR to be of the taxpayer. So till now the condition used to say that if it is not reflected then um, you cannot take the credit. If it is reflected, you can take the credit. But now they've introduced this word restricted, that if it is not restricted in 2B. So we, again, as I would say that this is a statutory provision, uh, the, is the, uh, which has been introduced under section 16. Uh, however, how will this be restricted in 2B? So we hope that in future, the, it, it should be possible that your 2B should reflect uh, which are your eligible credit, which are are your restricted credits as well and the ones which are restricted by your 2b itself so that should not be taken so the mere criteria that it is reflected in 2b can be taken uh, will no longer be valid because this is this condition itself is even not imposed by any notification or rule but this is a statutory condition which is mentioned which will be incorporated under the gst law and uh, the law also prescribes now uh, the cases where the restrictions can be imposed by the uh, system itself. So the conditions which uh, can be imposed for such restriction to uh, on the credits to be taken by the recipient, one of the condition is that during the initial period in which the vendor has obtained registration, uh, this is condition has been uh, mentioned, but what will be the initial, initial period? Will there be any such period or not? And how will this be effectuated? We need to wait and watch on this. If vendor has defaulted in payment of tax or short paid their liability, again, a very, very important change, uh, which says that if the vendor has not paid the tax or they have short paid their liability, then in that case, uh, the the uh, the ITC, which would be reflected in the recipients to be, it will be uh, mentioned as restricted there. So how the system will identify whether there is a default because, uh, see, uh, if I say uh, GSTR 2B, GSTR 2B will be generated only once the uh, vendor, the your supplier files GSTR 1. So, but the tax has to be paid in 3B. So if GSTR 1 is being filed by 13 and or 11th, and uh, he's paying the tax by 3B uh, in uh, by 20th. So at least for the uh, recipient, he will not be able to see whether uh, uh, the tax has been paid on that very transaction in that very month itself. Because though he will be able to see that this is the uh, uh, tax which is being reflected in his GSTR 2B, but whether tax has been paid or not, as of now, he cannot see that. Uh, so later on, maybe let's see how it gets if, uh, effectuated in the return, because uh, ideally it will be in the subsequent return which it will be get uh, which it will get reflected. So, but this payment condition is there. So this is typically to uh, sort out the issues of fake invoicing and all. So if your vendor has defaulted in payment of tax or has short paid their liability, then the recipient will not be able to take the credit. Next is if excess GSTR 1 liability as compared to uh, GSTR 3B or excess availment of ITC as compared to ITC available to them. So if uh, your vendor, he uh, declares, he uh, files GSTR 1, you are able, you being the recipient are able to see uh, their, uh, able to see it in your GSTR 2B, but while paying the tax in 3B, he pays less tax. So in that case, or he avails excess credit as compared to the ITC available to them. So in that case, uh, your GSTR 2B should indicate that that particular tax is restricted and the recipient will not be able to take the credit of the same. Uh, again, I would just for the sake of repetition, I would say these are not in effect as of now. And of course, there will be uh, many other notifications or the changes in the rules which need to be uh, brought in to give effect to these very conditions. Because per se, as of now, this kind of um, uh, functionality or I would say these kind of uh, conditions are not reflected in the rules and notifications as to how they will take place. Next is excess ITC utilization other than prescribed 
or in other cases prescribed persons so typically there are many uh, there could be other scenarios in which uh, uh, um, there could be the government could come prescribe some itc which would be restricted uh, per se and therefore it will be reflected as per se and there could be certain prescribed persons as well whose credit shall be restricted so this is a future going facility that the government is wanting to bring in um next is uh, prescribing certain percentage of liability to be paid through credit section 4912 has been inserted uh, it is also proposed that there might be certain percentage of liability that you are required to pay through the credit uh, it's not that your entire output tax liability um, can be paid through cash uh, as of now we believe that till now this kind of condition is there for certain categories of persons um, wherein that uh, 10% rule is there uh, uh, in which they uh, have to uh, pay at least 10% of the tax through their uh, in cash and balance they can take through credit let's see if any more categories are brought in or is this change just to uh, uh, validate that because that change was brought through rules this is now a condition imposed in the act itself so it's quite possible that this uh, condition is only to validate that uh, condition which has been put in the rule uh, however it may also be possible there are certain more categories that might be introduced wherein the percentage of uh, liability or uh, your output liability uh, shall be restricted to be paid through cash and credit and uh, this could negatively impact the cash flow also for the companies uh, gst liability this was our next uh, bucket in which we will be discussing the gst changes additional time given uh, again wherever i to simplify i would say wherever the dates uh, or the limits pertaining to um, uh, this 20 the september return was there everywhere the change has been made for a prescribed date which is 30th november so similarly for credit notes as well uh, wherein uh, the credit notes were earlier uh, required to be issued by the uh, for the preceding year uh, latest by uh, the due date of september which used to be uh, 20th of october but now a new date has been prescribed which is 30th november so now you get additional if we say date wise then you actually get additional just 40 days because from 20th october to 30th november typically but uh, uh, again i would say uh, whether it will have whether it will have to be shown in the october return or whether it will have to be shown in the november return is again a question mark uh, rectification of outward liability uh, 30th november so uh, this sec uh, section 399 has been amended to bring this effect uh, again in this the outward liability which you could have rectified earlier uh, the date prescribed was september a uh, due date of return of september for the next year and uh, but now this uh, date has been changed to 30th of november uh, an important change which has been brought in is refund could be withheld uh, this amendment has been made in section 54 which says that refund of any kind can be withheld in case of other non compliances or non payment of dues this is a very very i would say onerous provision which has been really brought in because uh, earlier uh, the, there was a provision pertaining to withholding of refund but those provisions used to be pertaining to if there is a specified liability which is confirmed on the uh, person who is claiming the refund and he has not paid that liability then only in that case the refund could be withheld uh, for example uh, there is a litigation which is going on against an assessee and that litigation has been finalized against him he has not made an appeal also and therefore he is required to make that payment to the department but him doesn't make the payment instead uh, for some other period if he had applied for refunds then in that case the department could withhold Hold the refund amount uh, from uh, uh, and deduct it towards the uh, set it off towards the liability which has already been freeze against him. So uh, earlier it used to work like this, but now uh, this is a very very vast. Uh, 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 wider gamut has been given to withholding of the refund claim wherein they say they say that uh, non compliances or non payment of dues so this could give a very very wide powers to the department uh, wherein uh, wherever there are certain non compliances or non payment of dues and if you have also applied for the refund claims with the department then in that case they might uh, simply withhold the refund claim and ask you to make other uh, compliances and uh, pay the other dues uh, so again i would say non compliances is a 
very wide term and non-payment of dues also is a very wide term because uh, when there is liability vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, when we say there are dues, uh, these the wordings which were there in the earlier uh, provision vis-a-vis -vis what uh, it has been proposed now, um, there is a world of difference in these wordings. So very vast powers has been given to the officers in these cases. Compliances. Uh, cancellation. If GST returns not furnished within the prescribed time, GST registration is liable to be cancelled. Uh, for composition taxpayers, it is three months uh, from the due date of their payment of the tax, If they do, uh, from the due date of their furnishing of the return, if they don't furnish their return uh, for a, a sub, uh, consequent period of uh, three months, then in that case, uh, they will not be able to file the, uh, the their uh, GST registration is liable to get cancelled. And for other taxpayers, uh, it says as maybe prescribed so uh, there could be uh, uh, the uh, for others it is uh, just as may be prescribed which could be subject to change through any notification or through gstr uh, through rules as well uh, gstr one filing gstr one cannot be filed for a period if the same is not filed for the previous period so this is just to give continuity to the um, um, uh, filing of the GSTR return. So if a person, uh, though this was, I guess this was already effected on the portal, but there was no statutory backing uh, for the same. So therefore, uh, this GSTR one file, now the statutory backing has been given in which it says that if you're not filing the return for one GST uh, for one period, then um, you cannot file the uh, GSTR return for uh, GSTR one for subsequent period as well. Uh, GSTR 3B, similarly, GSTR 3B cannot be filed if GSTR 1 is not filed for that period. So again, this is to give the legal backing to the change which was already, I guess, effected on the uh, portal. So now if you have not filed your GSTR 1, you cannot file your GSTR 3B. So first you need to file GSTR 1 and thereafter you will file your GSTR 3B. GSTR 2 is done away with. Earlier uh, details will now be communicated to recipient by way of an auto-generated statement. So earlier uh, there were provisions in the GST law, uh, which uh, the, the entire system which was brought in was typically a two-way system in which the supplier used to um, prepare the return, submit the return, and the details used to populate on the uh, portal of the recipient, wherein he had to accept, reject, and all those provisions, were, but they never came into effect, and therefore they were redundant typically, but now this has been officially done uh, with uh, removing of these uh, provisions which pertain to uh, two-way communication in the portal. There are certain miscellaneous changes. Uh, transfer of amount from cash ledger to a distinct person to be allowed under all heads. Um, fr uh, from your different heads, like if you have a balance in cash ledger in your uh, CGST, SGST, IGST, or even in uh, your penalty interest, uh, different different heads, you have some balance lying in one uh, registration that could be transferred to the other registration under the same PAN. So if you have another registration and there are a distinct person under in a different state, registered in a different state. So in that case, from one in, from one GST registration to another GST registration, the cash ledger balance can be transferred, permitted for all the heads. Interest at the rate of 18% and wrongly availed and utilized. Uh, this is a very, very interesting change that has uh, come up. Earlier, uh, the wordings were little ambiguous in the law, uh, due to which there were a lot of litigations which were going on. The department used to demand the um, interest on just the wrong availment also. So now they have clarified that it's not only availed, uh, if uh, wherein the interest provisions will be uh, applicable, it has to be availed and utilized. Only then the interest provisions will be applicable and that interest will also be 18% on the ITC wrongly availed and utilized. Um, the, it's an interesting thing to see because uh, there are a lot of decisions actually that have come up recently uh, in various high courts and there were many decisions in the past regime as well. 
which said that interest cannot be actually levied on just the wrong availment because actually speaking there is if you have not utilized it that means you have not short paid any tax to the government so uh, this is a repercussion of all those decisions that have uh, come up so far there are many high court decisions uh, uh, in gst regime as well in service tax regime as well and uh, this change has been brought in uh, to be in line with those decisions per se however uh, there is um, uh, since there is no bar so we have also come to know that there are many taxpayers who have earlier deposited tax at their interest at the rate of 24% which they have said that this is 18% and this is uh, it's not retrospectively from um, um, uh, 1 7 so from day one this provision will be deemed to have applied so there are many taxpayers who have paid at the rate of 24% so according to us if that amount is substantial then one should go in to claim the refund claim there is no bar as such which has been put in the law that you cannot claim uh, uh, the interest at which you have already paid uh, therefore it's typically uh, interest at uh, high uh, the more interest additional interest which has been paid to the government so one should go in for a refund claim also um uh, there are changes made in section 54 which prescribe the time limit for filing refund in case of supplies to SEC. Earlier, there was the only reason why this provision has been inserted is because there was no provision which governed, which said that uh, when the time limit for uh, would start uh, typically for the supplies which have been made to SEC uh, for the purposes of the refund claim to be made by the supplier. So now this provision has been inserted and it says that uh, whether it's for whether he's supplying in the LUT or whether he's supplying on payment of tax in both the cases, uh, the time when he supplies and thereafter when he makes that uh, writ, uh, declaration in his return for that particular month. So that return uh, period would be the period from uh, the time when the relevant date of relevant period of two years would typically start. So within that two, two year period, uh, he has to make the refund claim. Um, so these are the typical uh, changes uh, in the GST law that have been brought. There are certain other minor changes which we have really not gone into because due to the paucity of the time, uh, which will be there. And uh, now we will be starting up with the um, uh, direct tax portion. Uh, since there are many, many changes which have come up in the direct tax portion uh, itself, uh, I would just stop the uh, screen share as of now uh, here on this and would share the direct tax PPT here. I hope you can all see the screen. Yeah, it's visible to you. Uh, so now I will request um, Mr. Dipanshu Gupta to take over the session of the direct tax. Um, again, I would say, please raise your queries in your chat box and uh, then we'll be preparing for the uh, question answer round. Uh, Dipanshu Gupta is the head of our uh, uh, associate CA firm, Dipanshu Gupta and Associates. So uh, he looks after all the income tax matters, company law filings, compliances, audits, um, and all uh, CA related matters. So he'll be taking over the direct tax session. Over to you, Dipanshu. Uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope uh, uh, the, direct, the indirect tax sessions relating to customs and GST have been of uh, uh, great uh, use. We are moving forward to the direct taxes now. Uh, in the direct taxes, there are several changes which have been, uh, uh, which have come up in the budget. Uh, let us just move on to uh, the them one by one. Uh, from an income tax lab rate perspective, uh, as such, there are no changes in the tax lay in the tax lab. Uh, there are only two three minor changes which are proposed for 
the next year, which is uh, the financial year 22 23. Uh, the first and the most important one is uh, the surcharge on the long term capital gain under section 112. So, so far, uh, long term under long term capital gains surcharge on uh, uh, securities has been capped at 15%, but not for the other assets. Now, this is a very good step wherein the government has even restricted the surcharge on long term capital gain of any asset, uh, which is now capped to 15%. Uh, so therefore, there will not be any uh, any surcharge of uh, uh, 25% and 37% uh, on long term capital gain on sale of uh, other assets other than securities, as securities was already 15% capped before. Uh, the other one is uh, just to bring parity between the cooperative societies and uh, uh, you know and the companies. For the cooperative societies, the surcharge has been reduced from uh, twelve percent to seven percent for uh, the cooperative societies who have total income which is between one crore to ten crores. Uh, certainly, if the income is less than one CR, then there is no surcharge uh, uh, applied on them. And when the uh, total income is more than ten CR, then in that case, uh, uh, surcharge continues to remain same at twelve percent. For AOPs, uh, wherein there are only companies having its only members, uh, again the surcharge has been capped at fifteen percent. This is going to bring parity between the tax structure uh, of an AOP and companies, as uh, the same applies to companies wherein the uh, surcharge has been capped at 15%. Uh, from a corporate taxation perspective, there are a, a few changes which have been uh, bring in place. Most of them, frankly, have been made to, uh, you know, to cover or uh, uh, to make redundant several of the court litigations which have been going on. And uh, some of, and I think the intent, uh, uh, which is also even specified uh, by our Honorable Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman in her speech, that they would really like to ensure that they 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 provide the law in terms of the spirit of uh, what the law was made uh, at the time of uh, its uh, making. So the first one is uh, under Section 14A. Now this section uh, primarily talks about your. Uh, exempt income, your disallowance of uh, expenses to incur the exempt income. Now, uh, if in a particular year, uh, there is an there is no exempt income, but there are uh, expenses which have been incurred uh, to, uh, you know, which have been incurred to earn those exempt income, which maybe would not have been received in that particular year. Uh, those expenses have been allowed uh, in some of the in some of the litigations and matters uh, at different levels. And uh, now it is very clearly uh, expressed by the uh, legislature that uh, there is no provision of uh, allowance of those expenses which were actually incurred to earn exempt income, even if the exempt income is not received in the same year uh, or so. And uh, one of the interesting thing is that this is a non obstinate clause. So therefore, uh, this is going to prevail over any other uh, section of Income Tax Act. Another interesting change is uh, uh, brought in Section 37.1, which so far allows that uh, if there is any offense or if there is any penalty which is being paid within India, then that is not allowed as a tax deduction expense. Uh, so there are two layers to it. The one is that uh, apart from just the fact that there is penalty being paid, uh, so far that penalty is being construed as penalty under Income Tax Act only. While uh, uh, one of the uh, examples which was given in the memorandum to the budget was uh, regarding the medical profession, wherein, uh, wherein uh, you know the 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 it is it is it is already in place that uh, if there is any uh, expenditure which are incurred on uh, the medical profession, like some of those may not be like if there is any penalty out there, that penalty is. Uh, will not be allowed as a deduction within uh, the income tax as well. Uh, similarly, if there is any offense being committed outside India, uh, even those penalty payments which have been made out of the Indian entity uh, will also not be allowed as deduction uh, in the Indian income tax structure. So this is just to bring clarity around those two things. Uh, regarding Section 43B, which otherwise is uh, primarily about uh, uh, non-disallowance of expenses unless they are actually being paid. Uh, what used to happen is that uh, for the interest payouts uh, on loans, 
uh, there uh, there was a term which is called construed payment which could happen either in the form of uh, uh, those loans being converted into uh, another those interest payments being converted into another loan or so uh, there have been several litigations like it is it is a very clear cut situation that when those interest payments have been converted into loans uh, then that is not a, treated as a, a deemed payment and uh, along with that there is one more addition to it now that if those interest payments have been converted into debentures even those will not be treated as uh, interest pay discharge of interest liability and therefore they will be disallowed uh, under section 43b uh, this is basically to uh, you know cover the uh, honorable supreme court judgment in mm aqua technologies last year another one is a uh, uh, clarity which has been brought in uh, you know in the section 40a2 uh, this section primarily uh, provides for the fact that the income tax payment which is being done by the entity will not be allowed as an eligible expense uh, for the calculation of profit and gains of business and profession. Now, uh, there had like now uh, the cess uh, the cess which has been uh, uh, added since two thousand five. Uh, there has always been uh, uh, several litigations going around in terms of whether that cess will be treated as income tax or not. And uh, a detailed uh, clarification is being provided that eventually that cess is uh, a surcharge in itself only. It's an additional surcharge in place. And uh, surcharge and cess or any other uh, charge on or any other charge on that income tax will be considered under income tax only. And therefore, that will not be allowed as deduction. Uh, and this is a change which has been incorporated uh, retrospectively from assessment year 2005-06 since when the cess has been introduced. And uh, therefore, uh, it appears that now on, if there are any litigations which are already going on, uh, there could be scenarios where the tax department is going to add additional grounds and include, uh, uh, you know, this matter of if if for anyone the cess is already allowed as reduction uh, to disallow that uh, CO motto. This this is going to create a lot of. Uh, uh, litigations around because uh, it really depends on uh, what is the stage of assessment uh, for respective company. Uh, the next one is uh, the withdrawal of section 115 BBD. So this is this is just to just to move out some uh, uh, disparity between uh, the dividend received by an Indian company from an Indian company or from a foreign company. Uh, what used to happen is under section 115 BBD, a concessional tax rate of 15% was introduced in to bring it uh, in line with the DDT system as it was there uh, up to last year. But then once the DDT system was uh, uh, removed uh, by abolition of section 115O, uh, this section 115 BBT was still in place. Uh, now this year, uh, this has been uh, removed and uh, it has been uh, effected from 1st April 2022, which uh, will cover the financial year 2020-21. And therefore, uh, uh, and therefore, like uh, the, the, the tax which has been paid by the Indian entities as 15% on the dividend which they would have received from the foreign entity, they certainly would have to, you know, add it up to the base rate of 30% uh, or depending on uh, uh, what their structure is. Uh, the next one is uh, related to the TDS. Like this is a this is a new provision which has been inserted, which is section 194R. Now, uh, this specific uh, provision, uh, as per the memorandum, the idea is to ensure that the perquisites which are being uh, paid or which are being provided uh, by the uh, company or by the entities to their employees or uh, like to their uh, to their business partners, uh, those those perquisites were not being recorded or were not being uh, considered by those business partners in their own income tax return at the time of uh, at the time of filing return, and therefore this is a provision which has been introduced to plug that gap uh, as to and therefore uh, you know a liability has been a liability has been put on the uh, payer that while making the payment. Uh, of any amount of uh, any uh, value exceeding rupees 20,000 in a financial year, uh, TDS has to be deducted at 10%. Now, this is going to be a very important change because uh, there are several companies who, as part of their sales and marketing operations, uh, eventually come up with schemes and arrangements wherein uh, they are paying out, uh, uh, you know, they are not in cash, but then they are, pay they are paying out incentives or, uh, you know, uh, 
per uh, uh, items as perquisites uh, gifts corporate gifts and all those things will be covered here but uh, i think one important thing is that here the uh, individual value of individual value of payment being made to one person uh, above 20000 is being taxed uh, at 10% tds rate so this is going to increase a lot of uh, uh, burden of compliance under section 194r for the companies who uh, pretty much have a lot of uh, uh, perquisites which they pay as part of their business or profession uh, there are several other important things which are uh, which are relevant in this particular case like ideally this is only for uh, the gifts which are being made in kind and not in cash so any cash incentive is not included here uh, for deduction of 190 for deduction of tds under section 194r in a similar manner if there is any price concessions or there is any credit notes which has been issued uh, and uh, you know if uh, if gifts are being given to employees uh probably they are not covered here because uh, those are not arisen out of the uh, business or profession they employer employee relationship is altogether different and it's not covered here in uh the next one is uh, a, a little rationalization of tds on sale of immovable property so section 194 ia has been in place for a few years now wherein 1% tds has been deducted if the transfer uh, if the property value uh, is more than 50 lakh rupees uh, and and hence in that case uh, and this is a very good this is a very important change which was brought in a few years ago to plug in uh, several of those transactions and uh, ensuring that uh, if once the tds has been paid those transactions are brought under tax net and therefore uh, eventually the income tax is also discharged on those sales uh, the, the only ambiguity was that uh, from an income tax perspective the sale consideration is always treated as uh, higher of the transaction value or the stamp duty value of the property while for tds purpose that was not uh, the place so far so now even for the tds calculation uh, it is in place that uh, you know you have to deduct tds at 1% the rate remains same but not on the consideration which is being paid uh, but uh, on the higher of the consideration or the stamp duty value whichever is the case so uh, this is uh, one important change which uh, is uh, going to affect uh, from now onwards uh, there are several several tax incentives which have been uh, extended uh, because of the covid position in the country uh, and in the world as well uh, section 80 iac which was introduced uh, for eligible startups to have uh, a place wherein they can get 100% tax deduction of their profits uh, for three consecutive years out of 10 years uh, this was uh, uh, you know this section was uh, inserted in finance year in finance act 2016 and since then uh, the position was that the companies uh, those startups have to be incorporated before 31st march 2022 uh, it has been extended by a year or two uh, in the previous uh, finance acts as well and now this 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 has been further extended by one more year so now uh, those startups which uh, incorporated by 31st march 2023 can take the uh, additional incentive in the form of uh, tax deduction for 100% of profit for three consecutive years out of the 10 years there are certain other conditions as well which remain same but then yes like the sunset is not uh, 31st march 2022 i like next two months but it is one more year so that is uh, a welcome change uh, which is in place uh, the next one is uh, uh, regarding section 115 bab so uh, this is introduced uh, in uh, finance act 2019 2 wherein uh, a new concessional uh, tax rate structure of 15% for new domestic manufacturing entities uh, have, was introduced uh, at the time of introduction the intention was that this is going to actually uh, bring on uh, more manufacturing setups within india and uh, uh, so far uh, after a few extensions uh, the last date for uh, commencement of manufacturing or the production of goods or articles was 31st march 2023 uh, this has also been extended to 31st march 2024 uh, frankly it is a, a move which has been made on a timely basis because uh, setting up of manufacturing facilities certainly is a, a, a long drawn process and uh, uh, certainly if that has been uh, extended 
in the next budget, if I say uh, when the 31st March 2023 is just two months away, uh, that would not have served a, a very good purpose. Rather, uh, for all those, the planning would have started from now or the start it would have started already. So uh, it is a welcome change which is being done on a very timely basis uh, uh, in the finance bill. The next one is regarding uh, uh, section 115JB wherein uh, the alternate minimum tax for cooperative societies has been reduced from 18.5% to 15%. Uh, this again is going to bring parity uh, between the cooperative societies uh, and the companies. Uh, this is going to take effect from 1st April 2023. The next is uh, uh, incentives to state government employees. So uh, this is another uh, change which is being brought for the benefit of state government employees. Uh, so under section 80 CCD, uh, under the NPS scheme, uh, the, there was uh, already a, dis, uh, a deduction in place wherein the central government employees uh, who, for whom the central government is uh, you know, depositing 14% of their salary into NPS, uh, the same was allowed for central government while for state government employees, uh, this, uh, this benchmark was 10% of salary. Uh, somewhere in 2019, uh, even for the state governments, the benchmark uh, was revised from 10% to 14% by way of different notifications, but it was not included in the Income Tax Act as deduction. So that was a bit de deterrent for the state government employees uh, that they actually were eligible to contribute 14% of their salary, but eventually because of the, but, but even then there was no income tax benefit to them. Uh, now with the uh, this change coming in, uh, even the state government employees who are contributing, like wherein the government is contributing 14% uh, of their salary, they will get the deduction under Section 80 CCD for the entire contribution and not just the 10% of uh, the basic salary. Uh, and this this uh, amendment has been brought in retrospectively from uh, 1st April 2020, which means it is going to cover uh, the period right from the period when the notification for change from change of 10% to 14% was introduced for the state government employees, which is the financial year 1920. Uh, this certainly will ensure that those state government employees are not paying any additional tax liability on the contributions uh, which has been made by the government on, uh, you know, to NPS uh, for them. Uh, the next one is uh, regard so so this is a this is another uh, I'll say like a, a strengthening of uh, the TDS provisions. Uh, there, so there were two sections which were introduced a few years ago. I think last last year or last last year, wherein uh, section two zero six AB and section two zero six CCA provided for a higher rate of TDS or TCS in case uh, the assessee or in case the person is not filing his return for two preceding years. So, uh, so far, uh, this condition was two preceding years and then there are certain other conditions as well uh, under these section, but uh, the provision has been made more stringent wherein uh, this 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 uh, stipulation of non-filing of income tax return for two years has been reduced to one year only. So uh, up till now, if there is a assessee who has uh, not filed his return for last one year, but has filed his return for one other, one another year, uh, one another previous year, he was still out of Section two zero six AB and was not paying a higher TDS uh, on on the collection on the payments which has been received to him. While now, in uh, you know, eventually, even those SSCs will be covered. So the idea is that it is very, very important that individuals, companies, and everyone is should file their income tax return on a timely basis. Because if though if income tax return is not filed for even one year and you are covered under all the other conditions of Section 206 AB, then in that case, a higher TDS rate is going to be applied. Uh, in the same manner, a higher TCS rate is going to be applied under Section 206 CCA. Uh, one more very important change which has been brought in is uh, section 194 IA, which is a, a TDS on purchase of immovable property, which we just discussed, 194 IB, which is rent payments exceeding 50,000 rupees, and 194 M, 
these three sections have been delinked with section 206 AB or 206 CCA. The idea is that in these three sections, even if the returns were not filed, like even if the last year return is not filed, even then the TDS rate will remain same as specified by those three specific sections and will not bump up uh, under section 206 AB. So uh, this is a good move because uh, it actually happens that there are transactions which are being done under the immovable property, which uh, uh, wherein the persons might not have filed their income tax return for previous years because maybe they do not have, they do not have any income in those years while uh, they are just selling a one-off transaction now in the current year and eventually would not be burdened by section 206 AB. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very good move. Uh, the next one is about uh, the taxation of virtual digital assets. So this is a, uh, so here, like this is a very important move being done uh, by the government of India this year. Uh, we all are aware that there is already a bill in the parliament, uh, which uh, is about the cryptocurrencies and other assets, which, uh, uh, and other virtual digital assets, which uh, are there in the market now. Uh, so here a new section is being introduced, section 115 BBH, wherein uh, what entire income which you are earning from the transfer of these virtual digital assets, uh, there will be a flat tax rate of 30% uh, on the total income. Uh, the, the only deduction is the cost of acquisition of those virtual digital assets. And there is no other deduction which is allowed uh, in, in, case of, uh, in case of calculation of tax rate here. Uh, this is a very stringent provision in place because uh, even otherwise, like if you are looking into any other business, there are always instances where uh, the expenses are allowed as reduction, uh, while here there is no expense which is allowed as reduction. Uh, so that is a very, very stringent provision coming in. Uh, few, few queries which are uh, already in uh, this section relates to the set off and carry forward of uh, the loss if there is any such loss. Uh, for the SSC. So uh, here the provision is uh, very clear that uh, the set off is not allowed with any other income in the current year or in the any other or and certainly there is no carry forward which is allowed in the in the existing year itself, the set off will only be allowed within the virtual digital assets. Uh, so this means that if, uh, you know, there is a, uh, if, if, if someone has invested in Bitcoin, someone has invested in another digital currency as well, say Ethereum and all, and, it, and if there are losses in one and gains in the another one during the same year itself, those uh, losses can be set off against that gain. However, uh, if there is any loss in the virtual digital asset, while there is any gain in any other uh, in any other business, in, in, in any other income head, uh, be it your salary income, be it your business income, be it even your speculative income, otherwise related to your options and futures and uh, any other, uh, you know, short security selling and all those things, that all is not uh, eligible to be adjusted against the loss of uh, virtual digital assets. So this is a very stringent one coming in, uh, even though right now there is no regulation about the virtual digital assets in India in place, the law, the bill is in the parliament for approval, but uh, the tax rate is already uh, coming in now. Uh, and, uh, and yes, like there is no carry forward of laws in this instance, which is that uh, if there is a loss in the current year, while there is a gain in this immediate next year, even that gain, uh, you know, will this loss will not be carried forward. And eventually uh, on loss, there is no tax payment. But then in the next year, the entire uh, gain has to be paid uh, tax at 30%. In order to track these transactions, uh, there is a, a TDS, which is a new section for TD, uh, TDS being introduced as 194S. In this section, uh, there is a, a requirement on the uh, on the payer that if if he is making payments anything more than fifty thousand for specified person or anything more than ten thousand for others then in that case he has to deduct TD at TDS at one percent uh, of the transaction value. This the idea is to ensure that uh, all these transactions are being captured and uh, with the burden of compliance of TDS these transactions will be captured in uh, the AIS of uh, the the assessees. However, it is very, uh, however, it is like it is still important to see 
how these are going to be affected because then ideally like if you are making a purchase in any digital currency on any global exchange then uh, effectively this tds provision would apply to that global exchange as well uh, so there needs to be more clarity around this as to how those global uh, digital exchanges are going to implement uh, this provision if they are really not doing any business directly in india so a lot of uh, uh, clarity needs to be bring on the TDS thing. But then yes, eventually the TDS at 1% is going to help uh, plug in those loopholes wherein the income is earned, which is uh, uh, you know not otherwise being disclosed anywhere uh, in your AIS. Uh, one very important change within this, uh, within the virtual digital asset space is that uh, the gift, even if you are making any gift to anyone, even that is going to be taxable. Uh, under section 56.210. Like this is again going to uh, impact a lot of uh, a lot of individuals or a lot of persons who uh, otherwise make a lot of transfers in the form of gifts of, uh, uh, of other assets and not just the virtual digital assets. Uh, there is no guidance around the uh, valuation of the virtual digital assets, which we believe that should actually come up because uh, the valuation of virtual digital assets, specifically in case of transfers, uh, is an important uh, is, is an important parameter, especially when you are saying that the gifts is going to be taxable. It is important to understand that they will be taxed on the date of the transfer of the gift or on the date of acquisition of the gift by the donor uh, or so. Like there is a bit of ambiguity around that. Uh, these provisions are effective from first April twenty twenty three, which is assessment year twenty three twenty four, which is the financial year beginning first April twenty two. And therefore, uh, frankly, like there is just there are just two more months uh, before this provision is in place. Uh, the next one is regarding some of the uh, exemptions which are already provided in Section 10 of the Income Tax Act to uh, some of the uh, individuals and uh, uh, consultants who are uh, assigned the services under Cooperative Technical Assistance Program of the government. And uh, most, a lot of these uh, uh, exemptions which are in place, they have been phased out now. So eventually, uh, any income which an individual earn by way of remuneration uh, for uh, cooperative technical assistance programs, uh, he certainly will have to pay tax on this income from now onwards. Similar is the case uh, for the consultants of the funds which are made available to the international organizations under the technical assistance scheme and uh, the employees of those consultants and the family members of the employees or uh, the, the consultants, all of, all of these uh, uh, will have to pay income tax uh, now onwards on the income which they are earning uh, from these schemes. These exemptions have been withdrawn. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding goodwill, I mean, of course, there's a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of changes which have been made in the Finance Act 2021 in relation to the disallowance of depreciation on goodwill, uh, which was uh, brought in by Finance Act 2021. Uh, there was just one disparity which uh, was uh, uh, in place wherein uh, under Section 50, uh, when the calculation for uh, reduction of goodwill is being done from a block of asset uh, that there was no specific provision uh, which was uh, which was there to remove that goodwill from the block of asset so now uh, for the purpose of section 50 uh, section 436c2b has uh, under this section uh, this will be deemed as transfer and therefore, uh, once the goodwill is moved out from block of asset, there is going to be uh, additional tax burden uh, in on the calculations. Uh, one very important change, uh, uh, I think this is uh, so if, uh, is made regarding the private company in liquidation. Like there was a section 179 which puts liability on the directors of the private company, uh, and somehow the title of this section was uh, uh, was termed as liability of a private company in liquidation. Uh, while this section was always meant for all the private companies and not for just for the companies which are in liquidation. So that ambiguity has been resolved and uh, this has been clarified that uh, you know all the directors of a private company 
uh, if there are any taxes or any dues, like the recess and all those things are also included in the taxes. And if there are any such dues, which the company is not able to pay, then uh, those taxes can actually be recovered from the directors uh, of those private companies. It is not necessary that they have to be in liquidation only, then uh, you know the directors can be held liable for this. Uh, the next one is, uh, uh, a change uh, which is brought in the income tax act now with a with, with a good clarity and it's a retrospective change uh, being in place for during the covid period uh, we all understand and have seen that there are several employers who have provided uh, benefits to their employees uh, during the covid period in relation to their medical treatment or uh, medical treatment of covid and uh, and and even there are some payments being made uh, by the employers to the employees in uh, to the employees families in case the employee uh, you know has uh, uh, has has died during uh, due to covid in past uh, two years or so uh, and and not just the payment by by the employer even there have been instances where there are several fundraisings and uh, you know and and not the employer but other persons have also made payment uh, to the family of uh, any deceased uh, uh, employee uh, in all these cases, there was always a confusion in terms of the tax applicability uh, of uh, the receipts, which has been uh, in the in the hands of the employees or in the hands of the person who are receiving this income uh, after the death of the family member. Uh, so it is clarified that uh, as of now under Section 17.2, uh, this is supposed to be the perquisites in the hand of uh, uh, employees. While uh, now, uh, specifically, it has been mentioned that if there is any sum which has been paid by the employees uh, to the by the employer to the employees on account of medical treatment of COVID-19, uh, then those expenses being or, or that income will not be treated as an as perquisite in the hands of employees and it will be exempt. Uh, along with this, uh, in case the employee died due to COVID and a uh, uh, payment is being made by the company uh, to the uh, by the employer to the employee uh, to the employee's family uh, within the 12 month of his death then uh, the entire amount of payment which is being made will be treated as uh, non taxable under section 562 uh, it is important to note here that uh, there is no limit uh, for the payment made by employer to the employee's family in case of his employee's death while uh, if the payment is being made by any other person than the employer, then in that case, there is uh, an exemption limit of rupees 10 lakhs only. Uh, the law is a bit unclear in terms of if this 10 lakh rupee, which is being uh, paid by any other person than the employer, uh, if the payment is more than 10 lakhs, then the, either the entire amount will be taxable or the balance amount over and above 10 lakh will be taxable only. And I believe that this clarity uh, should be brought in before the finance bill is uh, finally turns to Finance Act. And uh, to ensure that this applies to all the retros all the previous transactions, this change has been brought effective retrospectively from 1st April 2020. So this is going to cover the entire COVID period here. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, NVT being paid to the disabled person. This is a very important change which has been uh, uh, made for the benefit of uh, the persons who are, uh, who are maintaining the disabled dependents. Uh, what used to happen under a Section 80 DD is that if there is any uh, payment being made by an individual or an HUF uh, uh, to an insurance company for the annuity of the maintenance of disabled person, even that is being allowed as a deduction, uh, provided, uh, you know, provided the person who is receiving the uh, who is, who is receiving the annuity uh, died any time during the year, then in that case, the disabled person uh, is used to, uh, the, the disabled person is used to be like, then in that case, the transaction, uh, only in that case, uh, this, uh, the allowance will be uh, given. However, now uh, it has been brought in place that even the, uh, even the assistant or the person who is receiving the annuity, even in case, uh, he, you know, he is not died. Even in that case, uh, the deduction will be allowed if his age is more than 60 and uh, uh, the subscription has stopped. 
so this was in litigation under uh, in one of the uh, very famous case of Ravi Agrawal and Union of India and others, wherein Justice A.K. Sikri has uh, himself suggested and uh, he observed and uh, he suggested that the government should bring this change uh, to benefit to the benefit of the disabled persons. And uh, now the government has made this change in place. Uh, the next one is uh, in relation to the search cases. Uh, in case of a search and uh, seizure case uh, uh, under section, so there is a new uh, uh, section 79A, which is uh, been uh, uh, newly introduced, which provides that uh, any undisclosed income, which has been, uh, uh, which is, which is being generated or which has been, up, uh, which is found at the time of search cases, that income uh, cannot like for the payment of the income tax <coughs> of that income, of that undisclosed income, the payment uh, has to be made uh, uh, has to be made by the person. Uh, so so far there have been instances wherein uh, you know after the search cases uh, there the previous year losses or previous year unabsorbed depreciation could have been adjusted with those undisclosed income. Uh, while now onwards that is not going to be allowed. Uh, even the definition of undisclosed income has been expanded a bit to cover uh, all the situations uh, wherein the uh, the undisclosed income could be generated and uh, several book entries are also been treated as undisclosed income uh, this is a uh, this is a deterrent step which is which is going to help uh, the income tax department collect more tax uh, from the from the assessees as eventually they will have to pay out uh, and they cannot simply uh, adjust the previous year losses or an absorbed depreciation uh, to the undisclosed income. Um, one very important change which is, uh, which is brought in uh, in terms of uh, litigation management or dispute resolution, uh, if I say is uh, the tax department uh, has a right now that they can defer filing an appeal on the matters which wherein the identical question of law is involved uh, with the judicial high court or the Supreme Court. Now, uh, this is a, like from, uh, from the memorandum perspective, I'll say that this is a good move wherein uh, the, the litigations are going to be reduced. Otherwise, we have seen a number of instances where uh, appeal uh, are being filed by the department for several years for the pretty much same matter of the same party or of the different party. And there are several appeals which are pending uh, between uh, with the High Court or Supreme Court. While uh, this is going to help uh, ensure that uh, the volume of appeals uh, is going to reduce a bit till that time, uh, there is clarity in terms of uh, the legal approach which has been finalized by the High Court or the Supreme Court in place. Uh, one important thing is that uh, in this case, uh, just by the framing of law, uh, there is no relief on the recovery of demand, which uh, otherwise the tax department could have done. Uh, but then, yes, if the intent is that the tax department is going to file an appeal, in that case, ideally, uh, whatever uh, amount which has been confirmed, uh, that still will have to be paid unless the assessee is going to file an appeal uh, against the order. So the next one is an updated return. Like this is a uh, new concept which has been introduced after the uh, original return, revised return, belated return, uh, and return under several other sections like 144 and all that. So this is a new concept which has been introduced. Uh, two, three important things about this updated tax return concept is that uh, this tax return could only be filed from the end of the relevant assessment year. Uh, from within 24 months of the end of the relevant assessment year. Uh, so what, what used to happen is now with the advancement of uh, the IT and uh, the, all the, all the, all the in information technology stuff which income tax department has in place, including AIS and all the uh, other stuff, uh, the, the time limit of processing of returns and uh, filing of belated return or revised return has been reduced drastically. Uh, if we look at uh, the individuals, individuals file their return by 31st of July, while uh, uh, for them, 31st December is the last date for filing a revised return or a belated return. Uh, in a similar manner for companies, it is just two months. 
uh, which is their due date was 31st of October. While for cases which are uh, covered under transfer pricing, it is just one month as they need to file their return on 30th November, and they are expected to file their belated return or revised return by 31st of December. So in order to ensure that more time is being given to the assessee and uh, eventually uh, in order to reduce the litigation uh, in place, uh, there is this new concept of updated tax return, which has uh, been introduced. Now, in this case, let us just take an example. If uh, uh, if if in the current if if in the current assessment year uh, we are uh, filing, so we are already so the companies are in the process of filing their tax returns. They need to file them by thirty first of March or so, and thirty first March twenty twenty two for the financial year twenty 2020, twenty 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 one. Now they will be given two more years from now onwards, which is till 31st March 2024, uh, wherein they can update their return, which they are filing now, basis the information which they may receive, uh, you know, uh, in the subsequent period of time. We all know that uh, AIS is in place now. That's a new concept, which is uh, here this year. And uh, yes, there are several returns which are filed uh, uh, at that time of uh, due dates, but certainly there could be an expectation wherein uh, because of AIS or other mechanisms, there is uh, an additional income which the company get to know. And in that case, they can make use of this updated return facility. Uh, however, the under this updated return process, uh, there is a, a like sort of penalty. It's really not a penalty, but then a sort of penalty which is in place wherein the companies not just have to uh, pay the tax which is due, but also they have to pay 25% of that tax if they are filing their return within 12 months or 50% of that additional tax if they are filing their return within 24 months from the end of the relevant assessment year. Uh, a more a more stringent provision is being placed uh, in relation to interest that the interest under section 234 a b c depending on if they have filed their return uh, originally or not would also apply so not just that they will have to pay the tax the the due tax on the additional income they also would have to pay 25 to 50 percent of that tax as well uh, mm -hmm. sort of in the nature of penalty though this is not really a penalty and this is also an important question which needs to be considered if it is a penalty or not uh, and then they also would have to pay interest on the uh, on the additional tax which they are paying so that is a bit more stringent a bit more stringent uh, for taxpayers uh, but then yeah this is pr a provision in place so uh, the companies can take uh, benefit of this section and uh, file their returns if they need to uh, one very important thing is that under this provision there is no provision of filing a loss return so eventually or reducing your tax liability from the original return which you have mm -hmm. filed so overall the intent is uh, just another mechanism uh, wherein uh, you know the companies can just discharge their liability if they are aware of uh, uh, the fact that there is some tax liability which they have to pay. Uh, of course, if there is any assessment going on, if there is any search and seizure procedures going on, then in that case, uh, these provision of filing updated return will not apply because then it is going to be overpassing the search and seizure procedures as well. Uh, so this like one of the, like if we are sitting right now uh, as such uh, uh, assuming that this uh, finance bill is going to be approved uh, or it will be in place it will get the president accent by 31st of march and again the uh, you know the filing return formats are also available then in that case probably the return for assessment year 2021 and the assessment year 21 22 could have been updated uh, frankly, assessment year 2021 uh, seems to be a, a you know a difficult target to achieve because uh, that there are there are long processes which are to be followed before uh, this is in place. Uh, not sure, like if especially for assessment year 2021 or financial year 1920, there may be some other provision or something which could be uh, available uh, once the finance bill turns to finance act. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, the faceless assessment scheme. So there are several uh, changes which have been done in the faceless assessment scheme. One of the most important changes is that uh, the date for issuing the directions for the faceless assessment under section 92 CA, 144 C, 253 or 255. Uh, as of now, the dates were 31st March 2022. <laughs> they have been extended to 31st March 2024. 
Uh, along with this, uh, there are several other changes which are being made in the faceless assessment scheme based on the uh, responses which we which have been received over last years or so. And uh, uh, you know, this is again a, a new scheme in place which is which keeps on rezigging uh, every year uh, to ensure that uh, it is in the uh, spirit of law. Uh, the next is uh, so so this is a very uh, imp like a very interesting change which has been brought in place under section 1192a uh, as of now uh, there is no uh, you know under section 1192a there are no powers being given uh, to the officers uh, to grant any kind of relief under section 234f wherein uh, the penalty is being paid by the person who uh, who failed to file their tax return under section 139 so now under section 1192a uh, the relaxation has been the, the power of providing relaxation is being given so we can expect in future that uh, the interest under section 234f could also have been uh, uh, you know deferred or like the the relaxation could have been given under 234f by the appropriate authority uh, we have seen over few years that uh, the international financial service centers, uh, there are several tax incentives which are being given to the IFSCs. Uh, in continuation of the same, uh, there are few more exemptions which are being given to the IFSCs uh, for uh, you know like who uh, set up uh, the uh, their uh, their funds or their uh, securities within India under the IFSC. So uh, this is coming up. We are moving on to the next slide uh, due to the paucity of time. We are uh, just 15 more minutes with us. Uh, the next one is uh, regarding the some of the procedures which relate to assessment and prosecution. Uh, here, uh, one of the important one is uh, that one under section 272A, the penalty of 100 rupee per day has been increased to 500 rupees. So that's a, uh, that's an important one, which is in place, which should have been avoided. And uh, uh, under section 271, uh, uh, you know, it is amended and uh, uh, it gives the power to the commissioner of appeal to uh, levy uh, any appeal pertaining to the undisclosed income or unexplained credits. So this is uh, another power being given to the commissioner of appeal. Uh, then uh, the the finance bill also provides uh, also clarifies uh, you know for the business restructuring purposes uh, that uh, uh, pending proceedings again at SSC is deemed to be uh, made in the name of the successor as well even if the proceedings were conducted against the predecessor. So this is just to ensure that uh, from a from a litigation management perspective, uh, the litigations are continue to flow from the predecessor to the successor of those companies. Uh, in case of succession of the business plan. Uh, uh, section 285, we will just move on with this. Uh, there are several changes which are being uh, made under the charitable trust uh, regime. Uh, we all know that there are two different regimes which are in place. One is section 1023 and the other one is section 11 and 12, which was introduced uh, in the finance bill a uh, few years ago or so. And uh, uh, we have seen that there are changes which are in place, which are coming in uh, between so now there is parity between several of the exemptions which are in place in the section 1023 versus section 11 and 12 so uh, this alignment has been done and uh, this is going to be a very good move because then uh, once the two once under the two regime there is parity the charitable trust can plan and uh, provide as to which scheme they are going to go into uh, there is some clarity also around uh, the expenditure, uh, the the donations which are received for a specific purpose for uh, uh, the the temples and other uh, institutions, uh, wherein if they are receiving some uh, amount in their corpus, that will not be treated as their income, uh, provided they are spending it as per the uh, provisions of the act. Uh, probably one or two more changes which i'm going to discuss now is uh, uh, from uh, like we we have seen uh, uh, the definition of slum sale uh, changes been uh, putting in, in the last uh, finance act as well uh, there is a minor correction in the uh, definition of slum sale wherein uh, the the trans it is not the transfers which are uh, it is not just the sale which is included in the slum sale, but all the kind of transfers are included under the slum sale. And uh, uh, 
uh, under section 50 uh, the you know when the goodwill is being reduced it will be treated as transfers and i think i covered it before as well so these are the changes which are in place uh, uh, in the finance bill 2022 uh, and uh, we expect that, uh, uh, you know, for some of these changes, we expect that uh, a detailed deliberation will be held in the parliament and there are several loopholes which are still in place in some of those sections which should be uh, ironed out and uh, before uh, the bill turns to act after the accent of the president.